On this edition of North Bay Bountiful, we explore the changing face of agriculture. Farming in California has become more diverse and new perspectives bring innovation. Immigrant populations are introducing unique produce to the marketplace. New farm worker safety protocols are being implemented and Native Americans are sharing knowledge about their traditional agriculture methods. It's all coming up next on North Bay Bountiful. North Bay Bountiful is made possible in part by Rocky, the free-range chicken, and Rosie, the original organic chicken. The Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, Made Local Magazine, and Sonoma County Go Local. Support also provided by Pepperwood Preserve, and through the generous support of the Sonoma County Water Agency. Cultivate. Celebrate. Connect. When we think of the American farmer, we might picture an older white man. But in California, the perception of the face of agriculture is changing. Lazaro Calderon is a farmer and the owner of The Patch, a small farm in Sonoma. If you see all around the country, most of the farms are run by Latino workers. For the harvest, sometimes for the planting, I mean, a lot of places are mechanical already. But when you get to know how to do everything, you know, it's easier for, for someone to become the owner because you're basically doing everything. Uh, and it's just not, a, uh, just not vegetables or fruits. It's, they're going into different directions, maybe cattle, maybe, you know, dairy. I know a lot of, a lot, I got a lot of friends that are owners of the dairy because of the same situation they had. They just, their boss, they let the, take over the operation because they knew how to do everything. Immigrant populations from Laos are strengthening food production in California by introducing new concepts and varietals. New York Times food writer Mark Bittman is working with UC Berkeley to explore agriculture in the state and reveals the struggle and contributions of Hmong farmers in the Central Valley. I've let pretty much everyone know that I've never had more fun cooking than I have since moving to California. One recent meal was a simple eggplant sandwich. But it wasn't your normal run-of-the-mill globe eggplant, but a Japanese eggplant, which you can pick up at almost any decent market in the Bay Area, or for that matter, the state, most times of the year. At the downtown Berkeley Farmer's Market, there are several Hmong families selling their produce. They drive more than three hours from Fresno, which is home to the nation's largest Hmong farming community. On a chilly morning, I was joined at the market by UC Berkeley's Jennifer Sauerwein. She helps small-scale Hmong farmers sustain and expand their businesses. I sat down with Jennifer to learn more about what she calls the changing face of California agriculture. The Hmong farmers, they've been farming since they arrived from Laos, beginning in around the 1980s or so. They were able to access small plots of land and adapt a lot of their cultural practices in farming here in the Central Valley, you know, in this hotbed of corporate agriculture. And so they began slowly cultivating a lot of the crops they were familiar with, and then they began looking, seeking out markets. So, you know, I was out there in Fresno a couple of years ago, um, saw some Hmong farmers, and I thought it was really interesting. They were struggling, needless to say. You have all these small farmers doing real food, mostly for their communities. But when you go to standard supermarkets, you might as well be in Boise. What's happening with the food in Fresno that small farmers are growing? Where is it getting to? You're right, the Hmong farmers are, you know, up against a lot of challenging odds. They've had huge challenges with limited English language and limited ability to access connections. So a lot of them have turned to farmers markets where you know it's fairly easy to get in and they produce a lot of these vegetables for their customers all across the state. One of those farmers is Bentley Vang who leases land in Fresno County and is a regular vendor at the Berkeley Farmers Market. Like many Hmong farmers he fled Laos in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. But since arriving in the U.S., he's been farming, and he now grows a huge number of crops on around eight acres. I have maybe like a 150 or more 200 kinds of vegetable. Jennifer travels often to the Central Valley to work with local regulating agencies to provide more culturally accessible training for Hmong farmers. So what's your current work, and what are you hoping to get done? 
I'm just initiating a new project to look at the impact of their drought on Hmong farmers. So what we're going to do is interview about 150 farmers just to get a sense of what strategies are they using to cope with the drought and the extent to which they're able to access the government support programs. Another project we're looking at too is food safety. There already have been some implications where the buyers are requiring the Hmong to have food safety certification and that's very costly. So we are already seeing evidence that some of the Hmong farmers are, are losing markets. Wow, oh that's <laughs> delicious. <laughs> So we developed a very straightforward training program for a number of uh, Hmong farmers in Fresno area. And it's a very hands-on applied food safety class. I mean, it's just washing your hands, making sure that you have a hand washing station next to the bathroom and you have paper towels. And one of the farmers, um, because he went through the food safety training, now he's able to sell to Fresno Unified School District. And so it was really exciting to see the benefits of those classes on some of the farmers instituting a lot of the practices yeah, that's right. and we would like to see more farmers being able to access markets like this. Meanwhile the stands at Bay Area farmers markets do brisk business as new and repeat customers like Jennifer and me pick up tender cooking greens, squashes and yes the best eggplant. I love these little crops. eggplants. It's fabulous. As climate change leads to warmer temperatures and we experience more days that exceed 100 degrees each summer, farm worker safety under these conditions must be addressed. You cannot harvest strawberries with a machine. You cannot harvest grapes to put on your table. I mean, there's so many things, they, they need hands. And all those hands are mostly Latino or immigrant people who are like in the fields all over. Every morning, starting at four in the morning, sometimes they have to work in the hot days. They have to get breaks. I mean, that's the, how it works, but still, they have to wake up at three in the morning to get into the field and work their 10 hour shifts. It's, it's, it's something that a lot of people probably don't think about, but it's really important for the, for the agriculture uh, business, uh, the immigrant labor. UC Davis scientists and educational specialists are working with farm owners and their workers in a bilingual program to protect against the effects of extreme heat. As you can see, look at how they're, they're going to be ready, it just pops out itself. People pass away from this heat, you know? That's what they need to understand. That this heat ain't no joke. They need to keep their body maintenance with water. If you have no water, you already know how it feels, you know? So with all these, you know, fruits and vegetables that we grow here, which is great, and there is a lot of demand for those, I can grow all the crops on my farm with 15 or 20 people, but then I need several hundred people to pick the crops. So we have a lot of, a lot of seasonal needs for people that just come in in the summer to work the crops. Heat stress is a very dangerous thing, especially for people who are starting to work the first day of July and it's hot, and if they haven't been working in the field, it, it can be quite dangerous. It's been years since there's been a fatality among an agricultural worker from pesticides. On the other hand, heat exposure has become more significant as a hazard for agricultural workers. Uh, for a variety of factors. One is climate change. The temperature is getting warmer and when you're working outdoors you are vulnerable. You are excessively exposed to that and at risk, particularly doing heavy labor. But there are other reasons. Work organization has changed, mechanization, pace of work. All of those are factors that have changed over the last few decades and made heat a more significant health problem, uh, in fact, than agrochemicals.
we emphasize that during the training is like if with this knowledge you can save the life of someone. Y si llegan a enfermarse mucho, 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 que les quedan, que se, estos ya se descomponen y ya no filtren. It's very important because the weather is changing and the temperatures are going to be like more extreme. We really need to be more aware of how that is affecting us. It's important to get, uh, get the people trained early, get them on board with the program so that they're they're drinking plenty of water, they're taking their rest breaks uh, when they're supposed to. I think it shows in, in, in the results of what we've been doing. There used to be frequent deaths in the fields from heat exhaustion or heat stress. In the last five or six years, there have been very few. I think that's, that's a result of growers taking on programs to try to prevent that from happening. Just taking the issue of a changing climate, we know the ambient temperatures are getting warmer. And that directly translates into increased risk for outdoor workers such as farm workers. So this is an effort to reduce the individual risk from the climate change that every projection, every single projection in a climate model says is going to occur. It's a project not only for today, but for the future. Modern industrial farming brings large-scale efficiencies to food production, but often sacrifices taste and nutrition. Small-scale organic farming looks back to traditional methods, but remains open to new ideas that increase yield and quality. Heirlooms, uh, the word heirloom came out of uh, heritage. Word heritage. Uh, means that if you get something that calls heirloom, if you save the seed, you can grow exactly the same product the following year. If they don't look nice, well, they look beautiful to me. Uh, they look different for most of the people who are just to get like the perfect round red tomato. Anything you get at a grocery store, like those beautiful red to perfectly tomatoes that you see, you cut it out and they're white inside. They're Green tomatoes, they pick in the field, they put them in, in trailers, and then they take them into a, uh, a huge facility where they put them in water, then in gas, with oxygen, so they can give them that perfect color, but they can transport them. A farmer's market, so most of the farmers, they, we don't. We have to pick the right tomato out of the vine and bring it into the tables. That is what it makes the tomato taste like a real tomato. Members of several native tribes throughout California have retained knowledge of plant gathering and preparation methods and continue to practice these traditions today. Members of these tribes describe the health benefits of using indigenous plants in the diet and explain how land degradation makes it increasingly difficult to harvest and use native plants. I just fell in love with this song. It's just an acorn processing song. It's a Paiute song from the east side. The Paiutes on the east side loved acorn, but they don't have acorns over there. That's why we traded back and forth. That's the reason we filtered over the mountains and ran the Chukchansis off of their land is because we wanted the black oak acorn, and we had to have it. Acorn is a pure living food. If you're putting something that sacred into your body, man, you're putting life into your body. I know the power of acorn. I know what it can do for the human body. Our men were long distance runners and they would just have a little fanny pack and put some of those conawoys, those dumplings in a pack, maybe with a little bit of jerky and then run to Bishop. There was some form of acorn processing going on every day in the village because for each person in the tribe, it took approximately 1,000 pounds of acorn to sustain one individual for a year. When you're processing acorn, I mean, it's work, 
but it is a spiritual experience. Acorn is in charge the whole time, and you better do it its way, or you're gonna wind up throwing it over the hill, because it's not gonna come out right. This little rock here can be made out of granite. Usually it is. It's called a Pessoa Wetinu. But I love doing this the traditional way. I've tried using hammers to crack and shell. The Pessoa Wetinu is the best way. It's a big process. Because, I mean, cracking and shelling, well, you've already gathered, so there's a big job there. And you made your acorn granary, and you sweat doing that. So you're ready to crack and shell. Once you get them this way, then you've got to get the red skins off. We set them out in the sun. Because acorns are full of oil, so when you set them in the sun, the skins start to turn loose. But they still have got those three seams where they grow together, and you've got to put a knife in there, a wee and pop that open to get that red skin out. And then you've got to leach it which is running water over the flower. They would go down to the creek, make a nice little mound of sand with an abalone shell, flatten it off on top, make a little dam around it, and either put cedar boughs down on the leaching bed or putting it right down on the sand. And they heat water in a basket with the soapstone rocks because you cook from the inside out. But you just keep working that rock around in there and you keep sticking your finger in there till it's the right temperature. And then you ladle it on your acorn flower and the sand pulls the water through the acorn. And then you're ready to cook. We're back to the soapstone again. Soapstone is extremely, extremely hot. And what happens when it goes in that basket with that acorn, what it's doing is actually roasting the acorn. And you can actually see that acorn brown in that basket, and it just brings out the richness of the flavor. You cannot get that in a pot. You just cannot, because a pot can't get as hot as this soapstone. I've got these things so hot when I put them in a basket, it actually scared me. So you want some really good chica onos. Chica onos are stirring sticks. And so you want some good strong ones and you want to be ready for action and you better be strong. And our grandmas were really strong. These are black oak acorns that have been cracked and shelled. And I'm going to split the seams open. Each acorn has about three seams. And what I do is I push the acorns, there's a little bit more in here than I normally would have, but I push them to the end, and then I just work my way through, splitting the seams wherever I see them. I try to keep some kawan, that's the uncooked acorn, in the freezer. And then that way all I've got to do is thaw it out and mix it with the desired amount of water, and then I've got it hot. My husband built me a tray that I can leach five gallons of flour at a time. But what I've done is I put it in other foods. You can put it in bread. I've even made pies out of it, pumpkin pie. There's maybe five of us in the North Fork area that gather acorns, and we can't even find enough for ourselves at this point. It is difficult to find acorn because the trees are unhealthy, because of the mistletoe, because of the competition from other trees taking their water. A long time ago, there were more oak trees. A lot have died, a lot. My grandmas would not allow their environment to look this way. They're gonna either cut trees, prune them. When they would go through, they're gonna burn. Their number one thing was their oak trees. And that sustained not only them, but the squirrels, and the squirrels provide for the other animals. So we're back to balance. Now it is totally out of balance. If you don't use something, you neglect it, it goes away. So the oak trees are gonna go away. And fortunately, we lost a lot of our culture. The animals need the plants, the people need the plants. Without the beautiful ancestors of the plants, I don't see how we could exist. Constantly they are giving, constantly we are taking. And that happens a lot with development when they scrape the ground and scrape the skin of the Mother Earth. And they take out 100 oak trees and they say, don't worry, we're going to give them back to you. And when they give them back to us, they plant them in a five gallon can. And you know that in your lifetime, you will never get to see that tree give the acorns, you know, and come to full bloom because it takes them such a very long time. So that's why we try to plant things ourselves in our yard so that we're helping them come back. You know. I'd like to welcome you to a few of the members from the Chia Cafe Collective. 
a group of Southern California native and non-native who come together for their love and interest in native plants and all the gifts that they give to us. Sage is so good for a sore throat, for your gums, if you have a lot of dental work done. The seeds can be ground just like chia. They can be ground and they can be toasted and you can make them into things. You can add them to your beverages or to uh, thickening as a soup or a stew. We used a very special type of tool, a beater fan. That's what we use to get the seeds out. Tapping them out so that the plant still was allowed to be there. And then toasting was done in flat baskets by putting hot coals or hot rocks in there and simply stirring them on top of the seeds and that would cook them into your tea. This is how you can make them in a modern way. Native plant gardens are very popular because of the drought, so people are learning that. They can have medicines just right in front of them. We encourage you to grow your own Barbara's been doing teas for years, and the white sage tea is one that she talks about a lot. And because it has all those nice things in it, like antibacterial properties, antimicrobial, antiseptic, it is very cooling on a warm day. As Chia Cafe Collective, there are certain results that we want from the work that we do, and Barbara one of the original goals that she had was to make a lot of our harvesting places accessible to people. It was also to provide education to not only our own communities, but to the general public about the importance of native plants. So today, our pellets have become so desensitized because of a lot of the processing that our foods contain with the white sugar and the flour. So we're trying to reintroduce people to some of the contemporary foods by having those items, like sometimes we do use white flour, sometimes we do use products like agave syrup, but it's to combine those two and get people used to that way of eating and then they can gradually start removing some of those products, the white flour, and kind of reverse the process of what has been done. All of our communities are threatened and losing people from diabetes and other diseases that come in from the introduced diet. So a lot of the tribes um, have been, you know, going back to their traditional foods and growing them and sharing them and utilizing them and making themselves healthy. So it's all about that, about making our communities healthy again and correcting things. We're so used to getting everything from stores. Those of us who live in urban areas and cities, everything that we need to survive for the most part comes from a store, whether it's food, clothing, a repair on your house, everything is from a store, it's there. Um, we're not used to going out and harvesting and gathering that ourselves. With chia, our traditional chia, you really can't find in our area. The chia that you find in the stores is a different species. Our chia, you just can't find anymore. So it makes me feel that there's this wanting for us to be able to grow that again and to harvest it the way my ancestors did. Because it's one of the foods that we can't go out in nature and harvest. There's just not enough of it anymore. What I just made right now, I used to call it chia candy, but we kind of changed the name to chia power bars because of the health benefits. It's something that you can take with you on a hike, or if you're outdoors gardening, you can keep it in a little baggie, and it really boosts your energy level. You can really add it to anything and get a protein boost from it. Aside from the protein that it has, it has omega-3s in it, so it does have a lot of health benefits to it. Just like I do with any plant, I'm looking at it for you know the nutritional value it has, and I see it as that's its gift that it's giving to us as humans. Those are the things that I try to pass on to the children, is trying to make that connection that the earth is what it's all about. You know, and I'm always telling them, we all come from different mothers, but we only share one mother earth. I think children especially don't realize that their house is made out of wood. Their clothing might come from a plant. Our tribe, everything we needed came from the plant.
our food, our medicine, our clothes, our soap, our tools, our basketry, everything. The plants were so very important to us as they still are today. So we are relearning those things today. We would like to call our ancestors by singing a song and welcome them to be with us. We always do that because they are our teachers. Tai hu nu ka ne shun ne shun Tai hu nu ka ne shun ne shun Na ha kwa ne shun na ha kwa he Na ha kwa ne shun na ha kwa he as a person who learned from my elders about these things, the only thing that I can really hold on to is hope. If we can start getting people to understand, I don't care where you go on this earth, you know, you better honor the indigenous of that place, whether it's the people, the animals, the plants, the water, because that's what's going to heal you, that's what's going to continue you living as a human on this earth. The moment that you disregard that, Everything is thrown out of balance. On farming, everything is about time. A lot of people use the moon to, to do their planting. Uh, sometimes I use, I use a calendar. Whenever I start my, my seedlings, I have to be very accurate with the timing in between the days. And you never know even with that because we're weather dependable. If it's not hot enough, it's not going to grow. If it rains, it's going to run everything. So you never know. But we have to we have to work on a calendar basis. It's very important, and I, I think it's for every for every farmer is the same thing. Yeah, and you know, specialty crops is, is like that. It's like nobody knows exactly how to do things. It sometimes it just comes out and it works out. When different backgrounds, experiences, and contributions are celebrated, we all benefit. The agricultural industry and the public at large are beginning to acknowledge how important a variety of traditions and perspectives are in maintaining a resilient food system.